whatever time you're listening to this, welcome. This is Real Life, Real Gospel, put on by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. I am Josh Laborious. I'm the vicar here, and I am your host for the show. And if you've never listened in before, first of all, welcome. Glad to have you. And if you go back on whatever platform you're listening on, whether that be Spotify or iTunes or Google Podcasts or Podbean, wherever you're listening, or YouTube, I think I got them all, wherever you're listening, you can go back. We This is episode five. We have four previous episodes, therefore, that you are welcome to go listen to. Hopefully, they are helpful. Hopefully, this one is helpful. And what we try to do every week is we take a real-life issue and we just try to apply scripture. We try to apply our faith to it. And what that looks like in reality. So I do, I avoid theological language. If you're looking for a very academic podcast, this is not the one for you. I mean, it might still be the one for you, but you're not going to get that here. So moving on to this week's topic here on Real Life, Real Gospel, we have social media and online interaction and where and how Christians should handle that. This topic was suggested, was proposed by Aaron Hickey via Facebook. If you are interested in a topic that we haven't done yet and you'd like to see it done, go ahead and send us a message, comment on whatever medium you are currently listening on, and we'll get that topic in. We'll we'll talk about it. We'll discuss it. So with that, we are going to move forward um, with social media. And there are, are some people out there who may have already tuned out who would say maybe that it's not worth addressing. But what I have to say to them is that in today's society, whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, people profoundly, deeply care about social media and what is done and what is said on social media and through online interactions. And if you think about it, people actually have literally died over social media because of uh, cyberbullying or things like that, people have literally been driven to take their own lives as a result of what goes on over social media. And if that isn't serious enough to warrant us addressing it, I don't know what it's going to take. Because what we've come to is this is now part of reality. And there are pros and cons to that that we are going to get at. But it's kind of, it's a Pandora's box of sorts. This online interaction, this social media thing has become part of the fabric of our daily lives, the fabric of reality. And there's really no going back. You can't put it back in the box. So with that, we are going to get to how we address it, how we approach it, how we interact with it. How should a Christian interact with social media? So with that, we present episode five of Real Life, Real Gospel. Real Internet, Real Gospel. Our first text, for those of you who are first-time listeners, what I like to do is I just go through typically three texts, sometimes more, from the scriptures to try and get out what we can address in our current reality. And the first text I have for you comes from Ecclesiastes 1, 9 through 11. It says, What has been is what will be, And what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It had been done already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Just some notes on where this text comes from. This is Solomon speaking and What he's saying here is that there is nothing that is truly novel. And an example for this is, I had a literature teacher at one point who was talking to us, and he said that every single story ever written since the Odyssey is really just a version of the Odyssey. You have a hero, you have a villain, they go on a journey, some growth happens, and the villain's defeated. And I think there's, there's some truth to that. There is some generalization of that. But I think the same can be said as we approach things like social media. And here's the relevance of this verse. Social media isn't something 
new. And you might say to me, uh, it wasn't around 200 years ago. Computers weren't always around. Social media is something totally new. And I hate to burst your bubble, but it's really not. Um, in reality, it just accelerated what humanity has done since the beginning of time. Share stories, exaggerate successes, downplay failures, hide flaws, send messages, complain. These are the things that happen on social media, and in reality, those have been happening for decades, for centuries, for millennia, since the beginning of time. Because this is how humanity relates. All that social media did was make it really convenient and really quick and it maybe accelerate those communications, those realities. So what can we take away from this? In many ways, we behave, we ought to behave and interact as we've always been called to. Nothing has changed there, but what social media has done, what social media has changed is it's given people, it's given us a veil of protection from retaliation, from consequences. So it's, it's the same social problems, the same social interactions that we've always had, but it gives us the illusion of protection. Because for a very crass and, and quick example, if I say something really offensive to someone over social media, they cannot reach out and punch me in the face for it. Whereas if you say certain things to certain people in real life, you're going to get clocked. So we have that example of it, it gives us almost a protection. And it removes some of these consequences. If you say something about someone in real life, you might have someone stand up to you. You might have some something happen directly as a result of your uttered comment. But on social media, you kind of have this thing, oh, it's just the internet. It doesn't really have any real consequences. And more than that, so it gives us this, this illusion of protection, but it also, it removes inhibitions. And here's what I mean by that. Um, if I'm thinking something at two in the morning, say this is 200 years ago, I'm thinking something at two in the morning that I probably shouldn't ever say out loud. I go to sleep, I wake up the next morning and I realize, oh, I shouldn't say that out loud. And that inhibition stops me from sharing something maybe I would have regretted. Today, I think something maybe I shouldn't say out loud at two in the morning and I can immediately say it out loud on the internet and next morning just wake up and regret the fact that I didn't have those inhibitions. Because there's no longer a time barrier necessarily between thinking and sharing. And that's one of the things social media has removed. And again, this is nothing new. It's just making it easier to do certain things. So we don't have to look for a new set of guidelines as we're looking, as we're asking, how should we as Christians interact with others on social media? We don't need a new set of guidelines. We just need to be better at applying them in a accelerated environment. We're looking for a new application for all of those old guidelines that are still phenomenal for our behavior, for our words, for our actions, for our thoughts. And this is going to send us directly into our gospel, which is where we're going to get. But the real life application that I want us to take out of Ecclesiastes is this. Social media is here to stay. No matter how much you complain about it, no matter how much you don't trust it, no matter how much you don't like that your kids or your family members or your friends or you, no matter how much you don't like it, it's here to stay. If you have doubts about that, just look at the stock price of Facebook. I don't actually know if Facebook is publicly traded. Look at how much Facebook is worth, is what I'm trying to get at here. Look at how much Facebook is worth, and then tell me it's just going to disappear because you don't like it. So that's the real life reality. And what it has done is it has accelerated and removed filters that used to be in our contact with one another. 
But in reality, it's nothing new. And the real gospel in this, the real joy in this reality, is that we don't have to come up with something new to deal with it. Our world isn't struggling through some new plague upon humanity. Our call, our guiding principles remain steadfast. And as we talk about that, I do, I want to go into our gospel. Uh, Matthew twenty-two thirty-four 34 to 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So some textual notes on this that I want to give you. Uh, first of all, these, these words that we always throw around, but very few people actually know what they refer to. Um, the Pharisees, they were, a, they were leaders of the Jewish faith in Jesus' day. Um, they were the, there were two main internal parties within the Jewish faith and they were the more, uh, powerful one. They were the majority party as, as it were, they had a tendency to play nice with the government. They had a lot of power and they wanted to keep that power. And if you were under Rome some, and you wanted to keep what authority you had, you played nice with Rome. The Sadducees, which is the other uh, group that is referenced here, they were also leaders. They tended to be experts of the law. They were more legal scholars, typically, um, and they were a minority party. So as they go forward, they ask this question to set Jesus up, to explicitly see if they can catch him saying something he shouldn't have said. And how Jesus responds is in a way that he can't get caught. He says, two th- he says, love God and love your neighbor. All of the law and prophets depend on these. And there's a lot of truth to that, because if you go through all the Ten Commandments, if you go through the Old Testament and look at the law and the prophets, everything drives to love God, love your neighbor. And it really, and that's what he's getting at here. So that's what's really incredible about how overarching this response is. It covers the entirety of the Old Testament. In reality, it covers the entirety of the New Testament. This applies to all of Christian ethics, and it applies to our situation at hand today, social media and online interactions. So as we go forward, what are we getting at? Love God and love our neighbor when it comes to social media and online interactions. So some general examples are on social media, you ought to be building people up. You ought to promote godly causes. You ought to use it as a tool to organize the people of God. These are good things, good examples of us loving God and loving our neighbor. But I want to look at some specific examples too, because there's a little bit of law in here. There there might be a little bit of conviction in here for you. Um, If you are dismissive over social media to a younger person because they're a millennial, That is not an example of loving your neighbor. If you are dismissive of an older person on social media because they are a boomer, this would also be an example of not loving your neighbor. If you call a large swath of the population an idiot because they disagree with your political opinion or whatever other opinions you have, that is not showing love to your neighbor. That is not being a good witness of God. Airing grievances against one another would be an example of not showing love to God or neighbor, not honoring God or your neighbor. And if you want a more uh, in-depth discussion of that, I would encourage you to go back. We have a podcast on handling conflict that might be helpful to you. Arguing with people. This could be an example of not loving your neighbor when, when discussions mutate into arguments that frequently result in a lack of love for neighbor. And finally, attacking or tearing down people. This includes 
famous people. This includes public people. So if you go on social media and say incredibly rude things about a politician or a musical artist or an actor or a, a public figure, that's not showing love to them. Just because you don't personally know them, just because they're some famous public figure, doesn't make it okay to exempt yourself from this commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. So as we interact with the media, it is, it is great for some things. It's great for entertainment. There are a lot of hilarious, entertaining, good things on Facebook, on Twitter, on social media. It's a great way to stay connected. I have friends all over the country. And the only way I have any idea what's going on in, in some of their lives is through social media. Because I'm, I'm not talking with them regularly. I'm not texting or seeing them regularly. But I kind of know what's going on because of social media. So if they're having a really tough time, I can reach out if, if that is necessary. Another thing this is great for, it's great for sports updates. It's great to see what the scores are. It's great to see what trades are going on. Um, and finally, it's social media, online interaction is a great place to show God's love to the world. And we say, yes, there is a lot of um, negativity on social media. There, is a lot, there are a lot of people who are rude and mean and vulgar and all of these things, which makes it all the better a place to show God's love, to be different in that way. So the real life, the real life of social media when it comes to loving God and loving our neighbor is that there's a lot of temptation on social media. We talked about this earlier. The consequences have been distanced from us. There's an illusion of protection. There's an illusion of protection. So there's a lot of temptation to not show love to our neighbor, to not honor our God. And it can be hard to show love in this medium because people do put their, their opinions and their beliefs out there pretty bluntly. So there's, it's, it's difficult sometimes to show love to them when you, if you disagree with them on a fundamental level. But the gospel is that God can work through social media. And we have a great opportunity to share and show God's love. And in reality, God has given us all of this as a tool to love his people, to organize his people. And as we look at the practicality of the benefits of social media and of how we can use social media for the good of the kingdom, I want to go into Hebrews 10, which says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The textual notes, when it says stir one another up, this would be encourage and build up and, and drive people, motivate people. Specifically speaking about good works, there's a commandment to be together. There's the day of the Lord, which is referring to the end times, um, to the end of the world, to Jesus' second coming. So what lessons about social media are here? I said there are practical lessons about social media here. Um, here's what I have for you. Considering how to stir one another up. Social media is an awesome way to do this. If, if you are on Facebook, they have a feature where for your birthday, you can host a fundraiser. That is a good work. That is an incredible way to build up God's creation, to show God's love to people. You also have sharing victories and ideas. Uh, one example specifically I have, I personally am in a group called Lutheran communicators on Facebook and they share ideas of how to uh, do graphics for a congregation, how to communicate best with members of a congregation, how to build up a community around a church. And that's an incredible way to share ideas, to build up the king, to stir one another up to good works. Now that being said, this Hebrews passage also, I think, has a warning for us when it comes to social media because it says, do not neglect to meet with one another. 
So all of this I've said, all of the benefits of social media, it should not come at the expense of the relationships that we are blessed with in person. Yes, we should be building people up online, but we also should be building up in love the people who are around us. So sometimes you got to put your phone away. Sometimes you, you have to distance yourself from the social media so you can focus on the people who are next to you, your coworkers, your friends, your family, your classmates, whatever the case may be. So I, I have some strategies for meeting together, some very real strategies, and these are not biblical. These are coming from me. So I hope they're helpful. If they're not, I'm sure that you can find strategies to not neglect meeting with one another. Um, one such example would be have a phone basket. My wife and I actually have one. Uh, it's hanging right by the door. And when we get home, we do our best to just put our phones in that basket. And that way, there, it's not a temptation to just pull it out and flick through social media. The temptation just isn't there as much. So that's one very real strategy that we can use. Another strategy that I've seen would be to have an agreement with friends that when you're together, whether that's hanging out or whatever you do with your friends, having dinner, whatever, just have an agreement with your friends. Be the one to speak up and say, hey, can we agree to not have our phones in our hands while we're hanging out? Another, uh, another tool that I've seen is on your phone, actually, you can download an app. I don't remember what it's called, but... Uh, it's a productivity app that you set a timer and you pick a tree and it'll grow a little digital tree, but the tree dies if you pick up your phone before the timer is up. So it kind of gives you an incentive, a way to practice staying away from your phone and, and just building up rules around phones, whether that's we're not going to have phones at the table or we're not, I'm not going to take my phone to bed or I'm not going to... Uh, I guess, have the phone out when I'm in a group of three or more people. Whatever it is, think out some of these rules and maybe put them in place and hold yourself to them. So the real life that I'm, I'm taking from Hebrews is we are called both to build one another and to meet together. This does mean not overdoing it on social media. We are called to regular relationships with people. I don't want to take away from that, but the real gospel of this is that social media can be a phenomenal tool to be stirred up. It is a gift. It is a tool. And we have the gift of fellowship in this way. And that is an incredible gift that God has given us through social media. So in summary, what social media can be incredibly good for is to build one another up, stir one another up. And this is a summary of the whole podcast. To show love to our neighbor and to God. Social media is a great tool for that. That being said, we shouldn't neglect to meet together. So if your social media is coming at the expense of your real relationships, pull back on the social media. Pull back on the online interaction. If you're spending all your day sitting at a desk writing blogs, maybe stop doing that and go out and talk to people. And meet with people. Go have coffee with someone. Go have lunch with someone. In social media, in online interaction, keep all of these in mind. It's all a balance. So the real life summary, as, as we're concluding this episode, the real life that I want you to take out of this, is this isn't new. All the temptations that come with social media have been around ever since people have been interacting with other people in a sinful, broken world. There is a lot of temptation that comes with social media, though, because it makes it all easier. There are a ton of opportunities for us to fall, for us to tear one another down. And there are commands to go forward in certain ways. We should be loving our neighbor. We should be loving our brothers and sisters through social media. But the real gospel in the midst of this, if, if you're stressing about how you have to change your whole attitude towards social media... I'm kind of glad about that because if you're in a position where you need to do that, I'm glad you're hearing this. But the gospel is that God is going to work through social media and work through his people's presence on social media. And God loves us even when we mess up, even if we do things we shouldn't do. 
on social media. That's not permission to do them, but that's comfort if you have done them. And the real gospel, the real joy that I got out of this podcast, out of my research for this podcast, is the recognition that social media is an incredible avenue for the joys of the gospel, for sharing our love for God and for neighbor. And if you take one thing away from this, from this real internet, real gospel podcast, this real life, real gospel podcast, it would be that social media can be an incredible avenue for our love of God and our love of neighbor. And that's what we should focus on as we are Christians figuring out how we should interact with social media. I hope that's helpful. Um, We will be back next week with another episode of Real Life, Real Gospel with another topic suggested by one of you, the listeners. If you have topics, feel free to leave a comment below. Let us know. We'd love to get it. And subscribe. If this is something you want to listen to regularly, go ahead and subscribe, whether that be on YouTube or Spotify or iTunes or Podbean or Google Podcasts. We are on all of those platforms. So whatever is easiest for you, go ahead and subscribe. And that way you'll get all of these first. And also if we release any bonus content, you'll be one of the first to get it. Thank you for listening. This has been Real Life, Real Gospel. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.